So I just want to look at the idea of the journal as a tool. So like all tools, tools are there to help us with things, or well, to do things we can't naturally do. So for example, unless you're Wolverine, we can't cut things with our hands, our fingers. So of course we have a, we have a knife. Our inability to carry water for long distances, we use the tool of a bottle. So a journal is also a tool, and it's a tool for what we're terrible at, which is remembering, and remembering clearly. And it's interesting if you've ever had that experience where you've been to the same event, you've observed the same event with somebody else, and you've come up with two different takes on it, and sometimes you actually have conflicting accounts. The journal is a tool, and I think it was really summed up, if I had to show it visually, by The Origin of Painting by Jean-Baptiste uh, Regnaud, where the story is, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's a Roman story by Pliny the Elder, and the two lovers, very much in love, but they have to be parted, and this is their final day. The only way she can remember her lover is the idea that he sits there and poses in the declining sun, very symbolic, and she gets a charred stick on the tomb and she sketches his outline. And that's one way of preserving somebody's memory and the memory of a relationship, but also, which is more acute, the emotion and the moment, which journals can capture. Now you might say that in the age of digital imagery, it's fantastic now. But if you're old, I love to remember what it was like pre-digital cameras. You used to have your 12 or 24, or if you were really, really, you know, swanky, you had 36 little films in a cartridge, you used to take it and then you take it to the chemist or you post it off to a developer and about six years later it would come back from the developers if you remember and then you'd open them and you'd just pray from those 12 or 24 you might get half of them would look pretty decent or semi-decent and then you know what happens you used to get that big sticker quality control quality control or your hand was over it or the strap of the camera so you know Digital cameras now and digital imaging, they're a blessing. You can take as many pictures as you want and you can even edit them afterwards and make them the way that you want them to do. So where's the curse in this? Because they are a blessing and they're a curse. Well, the curse is they tell you only so much. You've got the visual, but they don't really tell you inside the emotional story, the full narrative of what's going on. Even in this age, we're still stumped by that. And it's problematic for me, because, I'll give you a concrete example of that. Because I'm a member of our local history group, Mary is as well, Women's Show History Group, and we are privileged by curating thousands and thousands of old photographs and they're there already to curate but some people send us their photographs or they've been in a house clearing or they've moved into a house and found this box full of photographs and the problem is we have these fine images and nothing else so these people are kind of lost and their stories are lost forever so these, these are examples and these are examples from the Winshaw History Group's archives. And some wonderful, you know, I'd love to speak to that woman and ask, you know, who she was, the story about it. This is kind of a mysterious one as well. This kind of architecture. We reckon they're taken in Manchester as well. Some people think that's the old, the ruins of the old Manchester Cathedral which were given out when the Manchester Cathedral was renovated in about the 1870s, 1880s. Parts of it went all over the parts of Manchester, but we don't know who the woman is. And this moment in time as well, 
So if you recognise the church, you know that's a starter. I'd love to know the story of these two women that's caught for that moment in time. So to me, what journaling can do can be a great tool for something that we're really poor at, which is remembrance, but also this idea of legacy as well, which I just want to come on, on to. At a practical level, legacy means that your journal one day could be used for so much more. One aspect is it could feed a, an autobiography or an account of your life or extracts of an account of your life. Local history groups are really into, into recording living histories, oral histories now and finding out you know, these kind of silent voices where you've got these grand narratives going left and right. You know, we, you know, we can look in a history book about the history of Withenshaw, but these living histories really fill the gaps. These are the nuances which we often miss. At a practical level, people can leave a legacy. I don't know about you, if you've ever, you know, if, if you've had someone close to you who's not, who's not here anymore, passed away, or for one reason or another, perhaps have suffered dementia or Alzheimer's and they cannot communicate anymore. Well, that happened to my, my mother for 10 years before she died. She lost all communication. She was unable to speak or to communicate with us. And it's at those moments that you lose somebody that you often say, if only I'd asked them, about our family history, or um, they always used to talk about this Uncle Charlie or this Auntie Henrietta who lived such a place in this funny incident. I can't remember it now. And that's what you regret as well. But I was really fortunate because before my mother uh, developed uh, dementia, she'd done some work with a local history group. And she wrote an account of her life growing up in Ancoats in the 1920s. So she was, um, she was one of two sisters in a single parent family, brought up by a mother and the grandparents in Ancoats. And you know, uh, there's a lot of poverty and you know, she, she doesn't pull any punches about that. So her and her sister, Winnie Fred, she says about her mother had six other children, but none of them lived. Um, she was, her mother was in an abusive relationship, her father was, was abusive. And eventually left them. But thanks to this, I have something I can latch onto and hold on to and I have a legacy. So there's the remembrance angle. And for our well-being and help the health side, is when people are incapacitated like this and go into a home, like my mother had to, uh, she, she, she lost mobility as well in all power of communication. The staff were able to use this and place it near her bed. So anybody visiting or any new members of staff could read it. So my mother was no longer a statistic or a label. She was a person. So that's the power of what journals can do and about your life experiences. If you think, oh, this is inconsequential what I'm writing at the moment, it's just about me. It's gold dust. It really is gold dust. You'd be surprised at how valued that can be. So I don't know if anyone else has kind of experienced that or you know where, where you've had been fortunate enough to have that account of someone in their family. You have it, Tasha. Yeah, yeah I've kept um, a poem my mum wrote, it was a long time ago, to her mum that had passed. Yeah. And it's all handwritten, and I've kept it, it's in her own words and everything. Keep it with me. Must be really special. Nice. Yeah. Like an heirloom as well, yeah. isn't it? You can pass down. Yeah. yeah. When it gets heavy, I usually have a picture of a puppy dog that comes up on the screen. <laughs> so uh, we have puppy time, okay? But we'll, we'll, just, we'll just hold on to puppy time. But we do have a writing activity. And this is 
really linked to what I was mentioning because we are more than our names. And perversely, I just want you to skip activity two, which is called the naming of me. And I want us to riff on this activity, which is a riff on Desert Island Discs. So if you remember Desert Island Discs on Radio 4, get a guest on and they usually say, they usually um, choose their favourite pieces of music and the associations, why they like it. So what I'd like to do now is for you to write about maybe five of your favourite pieces of music and explain why they are significant to you. And if you get time as we go along, we'll, we'll set aside that eight minutes, okay? Maybe eight to ten minutes. If you were stranded on a desert island, what three items would you bring with you? And choose one luxury item as well. Three items plus one luxury item, what would they be and why would you choose those things? Is that all right? Have you explained that okay? We all know what to do, yeah? So I'll just leave that to you and I'm sure that Motown might, might feature in somebody's writing, yeah? So it'll be really interesting to see what you write. Thank you. Be really intrigued to uh, hear what what music drives you and what you really enjoy. Um, do you want to chip in? Has it on? Okay, you want to tell me it's the first time. I'm a bit more than the music. So my first piece of music would have to be Jackie Wilson, The Sweetest Feeling. It reminds me of Holidays in Dublin as a child and listening to Radio Caroline. And it started my love and soul with Motown and love and soul. My next would be Wear It Well, Rod Stewart. One of the few singers I like who isn't so Motown and love and soul. Then an Irish song, Dirty Old Town by the Dubliners. It wasn't their song, but I think they sing it the best. Number four would be the Balbalettes. These things will keep me loving you. It reminds me of my first soul night in St. Bernadette's on Princess Park, age 15. Still ask for it now at love and soul events. Finally, not the whole song, too many to choose from, but favourite is Crying in the Night by the Monitors. Uh, my three items, first my sunglasses, can't see without them, then a radio for music and listen to conversation, then a camera to record what I've seen in case I'm rescued, and my luxury item will be a face cream. Brilliant, oh well, thanks for that, and thanks for sharing it. I'm just like, some of those songs I know, yeah, some I don't know, know yeah. Definitely. Jackie Wilson. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else like to share their, their music? Anybody? Do you want to? Audrey, do you want to? Oh, you're just scratching my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an auction, you never do that. Um, I didn't write about specific songs, but I wrote about a genre. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, I gave you the title because I'm pretentious like that. Um, it's called An Odd to Rock and Roll, A Love Letter to Heavy Metal. Um, mm. I didn't start with the classics, got intrigued by a red-haired stranger on the cover of a French tabloid at age eight. The words read suicide. There was a photo of a blonde woman featured in the article, her full pout, the colour of his hair. I didn't know what suicide meant. A few years later, I heard smelled like teen spirit for the first time. It was Mike Shinoda and Chester Bennington who blew my mind with the sounds of their sweet, angry, metallic melodies. The anger, the confusion, the power, hymns for the misfits. Growing up on an island dressed in all black, illegal, underground gigs, Bird Six and Patti Smith. A feeling of belonging, finally, digging and discovering. I started to add guns to my roses and fueled rage against an unfair judgmental machine. Being seen, being understood, voicing out all the confusion inside to get closer to who I am and who I ought to be. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing. Okay, generally for perspective. And by perspective, I just mean that often in our journals, and it's a kind of attached to remembrance, is that. The perspective I'm thinking about 
is how often we can blow up small events and catastrophize them into something greater. Whereas looking at your own journal, also looking at other people's journals, you know, those that I'm kind of looking at, it just gives a sense of a kind of a longer, wider canvas of perspective. But also, when we've got close friends, or someone close to us, and suddenly, you know, we're really close to them, and they may say something off, or they may do something that kind of annoys us. And sometimes we do take offence. It's lovely when we've recorded all those good things that that person's done for us, and that gratitude that those people have done there. And there's your perspective. It just brings back that balance that you see the longer picture, you see the longer narrative of that friendship. And, how, how it pans out. So I just thought that journaling is, you know, is really important. And again, there's the, the well-being aspect of it, just to calm yourself and see that problem at the moment will soon pass. So you know, if, you ever, if, you, if you like Rumi, the poet, and the guest house, if you ever read that about your problems coming in, or just like guests into a hotel, just like meeting Basil Fawlty, but thankfully, they'll leave as soon as, as quickly as they come. And of course, they're great for reflection and for reflecting. And I think it's the kind of reflection that's good for seeing the past, but also gauging where you are and that kind of reflection of where you're situated at present. And whether looking over the recent journal in your entries, it's becoming very repetitive. And maybe there's an indication that you want to, you, should, you should try something a little bit different. Just change that habit, which again is great for well-being. Just change that routine. So a routine read for rut, you know, that rut you're in. And it doesn't have to be something massive, but it could be going for a break. It could be taking a, a holiday. It could be just something different, like um, walking home by a different route, going a different route to the shops and that. A great activity is actually to sit in a different chair in the same room. That you always get your like, favourite chair, don't you? You know, kind of territorial. But sit in another chair and just see the view from there. Go for a walk in the park. So you're starting to change the content of the journal. So it's a great way of measuring where you are and where you're situated in the present and you can change change that. One, one of the main parts of, of hope is the fact that journaling for yourself is good for well-being but there's also a cause for hope by reading other people's journals those like we kind of mentioned as well and it really kind of places our uh, present issues in some kind of perspective. Also, the hope is that however bad it might seem or present, there is change. There are, things do change and hopefully do develop. And I think one part of hope is to think that, you know, happiness in life is an aberration. You know, if, you, if, if happiness is your goal in life, you're going to be disappointed. Happiness comes, you, it's there for a short while, you make the most of that time, but then, life's messy, it moves on, and it's really about that kind of hope is always there. I think um, journals are really tools for hope, and reading those of others who have kind of mentioned a couple of people can inspire us. And, you know, Emily Dickinson there, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul, sings the tune without the words, and never stops at all. And I think that's a great, you know, to see that hope Kind of running through your journal that you know that you are going to do something set yourself maybe goals in that journal what you'd like to do even small steps so it should also be a, a, a hopeful framing i'm not saying that it lacks authenticity it's really to the hope that comes from turning the emotions and those negative emotions and transforming them into words to name what's the problem, to name the problem that you can look at it in perspective, it's out of your system, you know, psychologically it's out of you, 
it's somewhere else now, there's a detachment which gives you the opportunity to gain the perspective of analysing it outside and a journal is fantastic for that. Fucking time, yeah. so I was getting heavy there. <laughs> Fucking time. There we go. <laughs> notebook. So, Audrey, you mentioned notebooks. So, just to show that I do practice what I preach, yeah, it's about notebooks. You know, I just carry them, uh, don't carry all these, obviously. <laughs> but um, these are all the kind of mark for the months and the years, and uh, just fill them, you know, observations, take them with me, and on the hoof really, what we do. So carry them at all times. Do you carry notebooks anyway? Other than a diary. I mean, you know, a diary's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. that, that's amazing, yeah. And do you find them useful? Yeah. Yeah, they are, are aren't they? they, they you know, for, for various reasons. I mean, a diary's a functional book, isn't it? You know, you've got your events and, you know, meetings and maybe to-dos. But notebooks are totally different. So it's really those thoughts and feelings, you're capturing them right in the moment. And you've got this brilliant idea and then somebody kind of interrupts you and then it's gone. It's gone forever, it's so frustrating. But if you can just capture it in that notebook and then that can filter into your journal later on else. It's like there's, there's the exploration, you know, craft and you're bringing it back to the mothership, which is the journal, and kind of writing it up, or never writing it up, but it might you know, become a poem, it might become a short story or a novel, some of those ideas. And I always say that writers are um, curious and observant, but really I just mean writers are just so nosy. You know, it's, yeah, it's the better. art of being, not yet, you know, it's the art of being nosy, isn't it? It's sitting it's nice. in the cafe, yeah. you know, the cafes, yeah. those things where people could sit and have a coffee yeah. and just observe, like, overhearing a conversation and you can write down natural dialogue or, that's a brilliant story she's telling, yeah. oh yeah, I could make a story out of this, you know, and I like that diction, not those words she's using or he's worth using, so... All those are, are fantastic, and when we're sat in a park and it's a lovely summer, summer's day, or it's a lovely day like today, it's just that recording, being grateful for the moment, that you're in that moment and experiencing it, a type of mindfulness, attitude and gratitude, so you sneak that one in, haven't you, see, well they, yeah, they love them, it works, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, it works. And I'd say they're not expensive, you know, you can get one, yeah, Poundland, you know, pick up a, a notebook, for sure you can. And they can aid, like I say, writing, if, you know, if writing's your thing as well, and feeds into your journal. So definitely, if you can carry a, a notebook around with you. I mean, it's the story of Coleridge, wasn't it, writing Kubla Khan? He's like, he woke up, didn't say. He said it, oh, I had it in a dream, well, it was kind of an opium-induced dream. So he, he wakes up and he's writing this fa fabulous poem, you know, in Xanadu, de Kubla Khan, a giant pleasure of the decree. And there was a knock at the door, and it was a visitor from Porlock, just up the road, come to visit him. So he disturbed his train of thought, and that's why it's unfinished. He couldn't get back to writing it. Kubla Khan. So if you'd had a notebook, Coleridge, see? Yeah. Might have been so much different. And, you know, I really like that W.H. Davis, you know, the super tramp who, you know, visited, he was British, travelled to America, lived the life of a vagrant, you know, the band, you know, super tramps named after him. And look at that mantra. He starts off the poem, what is this life in full of care? We have no time to stand and stare. And then he answers it, doesn't he, at the end of the poem. Our poor life this is, it's full of care, we have no time to stand and stare. So notebooks are all about that, you know, to be observant and save the moment. So really, it's just a recap on that, the journaling benefits. It's the routine that journaling gives you, you know, establishing good routines, having something that you do daily. For some people that live, hectic, chaotic lives, 
a journal is really useful for that. It's good for thoughts and organising thoughts. I think if you have that, there's apps for this, isn't there? But if you link it, there's a chain, and you actually see that you're, you know, you're keeping and maintaining this journal. It's something to be proud of, and it's a sense of achievement. But equally, if you miss a day, skip it, don't beat yourself up about it. Just carry on, or backtrack and fill in that gap. It's just a friend, someone you can confide in. Never going to criticise you. I just wanted to show there as well. It can help with you know the outside of the society. You know they do recommend keeping the journal and notebooks as part of uh, memory and uh, work, working on the mind. Keep you know uh, anything that's keeping the mind active. It's not going to stop anything but it can slow it down and it can keep you active as well so if you have the latest research 2016 is showing that and I like this one Nickerson which is kind of Santos in 2019 that surveys that they did a really long survey you know big 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 uh, study group that people tend to be happier through experiences rather than material possessions. And I think the journal's a great way of capturing those happy moments. And when you're in, you know, in a rut, in you're having a bad time, you can revisit the happy times that are in your journal as well and offset those bad times. And I love this sort of title, you know, like academic texts are just so boring usually. You know the title, but given the chief, Jilovic and Kumar will always have Paris. Answer that for an academic paper. Positive experiences trump material gain. And it just says there, you know, like the top quotes of all time. We've got Ricks from Casablanca there when he says, We'll always have Paris. We'll always have Paris. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> that was terrible that wasn't it, it was like, so I was like, I'm trying to walk to speed, you know, but you get the drift, yeah. and he's saying that, you know, the experience of Paris with, with you know, it's the experience and the memory means more than anything that is material, people tend to, tend to savour the experience over the gift. I mean, I don't know about yourselves, but you probably have fonder memories of times you spent with people and experiences doing things than, you know, opening your iPhone or getting a new iPhone or, you know, whatever, you know. So I kind of journals are kind of, kind of paralleling, you know, with this. And the research is showing this as well. And look at those, I mean, it's some people go overboard or they really, you know, make and critify and they keep the bus tickets, tram tickets, cinema, theatre tickets, photographs, and they become an art form. So our mind's really prosaic and basic, mine's just like a word processor. But what, what's the principle is? A4 line paper, isn't it? And you've got a pencil or a pen, that's all you need. Of course, you know, you really want to go to town on it and keep it. You can make it into a work of art that really reflects you, you know, it, they can be as unique as you want them to be. And for some people, might want to try a different one, so, you know, recording. You do get the extra dimension of hearing the person's voice. It's quicker if you, you know, if you strap the time, you might want to record your journal that way. I use, um, last time I was, I was I was giving this talk about journaling. I kept talking about Otter AI, which is incredible. It just really is. It's a free app on smartphone or iPhone. I kept going on about it so much, I thought, they thought I was on commission for <laughs> Otter AI. But if you download it, you speak into it, and it types up your, your, your speech as you speak into it. 
It's just incredible. And what only, you know, not only that, not only that, look, not only that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> selling you some snake oil here. You can press the words that are typed up in your voice, you know, it's, the, it's that segment of what you've said. So you can just go over it, you know, retype anything that's not picked up properly. Uh, and that's great. So if you're recording living histories of people, anything like that, it's wonderful because it saves so much time. So you can just have one recorder there and Otter AI open and you've got your transcript written like that. So that's something else you might want to do. I've tried app versions of journals, it doesn't work for me. I can see the attraction where you can put, uh, you can put pictures in, but it hasn't, if it hasn't got a desktop version for me, it probably won't, doesn't work at all. You can do that with Word anyway, you know, lots of that. So here's a couple of resources. There you go, just uh, there's a little plug. So we've got tutorials and blogs on there, we've got the uh, poem analysis, so if you've got anyone that's studying for exams at the moment, we do textual analysis and we do lots of kind of writing, don't we? Uh, writing tips. Writing tips, yeah. So we've got plenty, plenty there, I think we've about 60 odd videos. There's on, a whole on there. section on writing a novel if anyone is interested. Yeah, section on writing all the way up to publication uh, on there as well, and planning. That's worth looking at, Professor Laurie Santos, University of Yale. So if you're into the research, you want to look at the science behind happiness and the science behind um, preserving memories. Uh, Laurie Santos there, uh, if you go up there, she's got lots of information, plus two really good TED Talks. If you like TED Talks, um, she's on there as well. Immortality. Yeah, I'm kind of you think it is snake oil time, isn't it? You're going to say that, isn't it? Come on now, here we go. Immortality, I can, I can tell. Well, there is a kind of immortality in what we write, isn't there? I mean, Shakespeare had, you know, he scotched it, didn't he? He had it right in Sonnet 18, where he said, Nor shall death brack thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest, so long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Basically, that's what a journal does. It preserves your life, and it preserves all those people that you write about. So those people that maybe are not great at writing, don't have you know, the inclination to, you are actually recording their lives, and like the lover in Shakespeare's sonnet, he or she is preserved forever in that sonnet. It's neat, isn't it? So it is a form of immortality, what we're talking about. Journals are capsules of immortality. Before we finish, um, if you'd like to share some ideas, I just want to finish with this activity. And it's this one, the naming of me. We get more focused about ourselves now. I think labelling is so important. Because we didn't choose the names we were given. So it would be really interesting to see, well, you know, how the course of our lives has been reflected in names. So I put here, you know, names can be labels. We're named. But does your name mean something? What do you know about your name? Does it have any particular significance? Does it have any kind of cultural significance? For example, is it also a completely new, like, coin name? Was it made up? How much do you know about that name? Or has your name changed, and if so, why? Did you have a pet name or a nickname, family or friends at school, and what were they? So I see how you can kind of chart your life through names as well. So this is quite a really nice kind of icebreaker activity I just wanted to share with you. And if you could choose a name today, what would it be and why? I used to work with um, prisoners 
and two things they used to do to it, like the authorities, was they used to change the religion so they could ask for diets, dietary, you know, so it could be a real pain in what you could eat. I'm not eating that and that. And the other one was always changing the names by deep hole. And the weirdest one I ever got was a guy who changed his name to Rocky Martini <laughs> because he fancied himself to be a bit of a superhero James Bond type, Rocky Martini. So if you want to try and uh, project yourself from the past to if you like your name or change it, or if you're happy with your name as it is, that's good too. So we'll just finish off with this five minute writing activity and uh, we'll feed that there. Okay? Just go and look at these, this idea, these kind of interesting names. Um, I always think it's a really interesting way of seeing how we are labelled. Natasha, would you want to share yours? Um, I was given my name by my father before he passed. I've given my name before she because I've had plenty of people tell me this over the years. Growing up, my name was quite unique, not many people had it, which made me feel special and one of a kind, unlike today when I hear the name is actually quite a lot. <laughs> not many people had it growing up, so. No, no, I'm just thinking that. Just come across it occasionally, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to share anything about their, their names? Sure, I'll share. Oh, um, thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Rebecca, biblical name, but with a different spelling. Also the title of the Hitchcock movie, which is quite neat, except the character <laughs> is dead. That's not a spoiler, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I like my name, as I don't run into too many other Rebeccas. Once I was in a uni class that had five other Rebeccas, but that was a one-off. Maybe the class was well-suited for Rebeccas. If I were to change my name, I would likely regret it, as I am a creature of habit with most things, and quite shy to have to explain why my name is Zardana, Keeper of the Seventh Gate, and thank you for the annoying. Uh, I was simply Becky in school, and am still now. <laughs> That's it. Do <laughs> you think yours is bad? I used to work in an office with uh, two other Steves, or Stevens, and we had to work out, you know, it's going to be called Stephen, and there's our Steve 1 or Steve 2. And every time someone popped their head into the office, it's like Steve, like three of us would just dart our heads round. So yeah, I know where you're coming from with that yeah. one. <laughs> Anybody else like to share? Yeah, I don't know. Thanks a lot, Will. Uh, William's a very common English name, that, uh, apparently from the Norse Wilhelm, the home of strong wilderness. Oh. I found it causes trouble in non-English languages, uh, the double L, particularly in Japanese, I don't know, this <laughs> just doesn't exist, so I have to woo. Uh, Miles is a very normal British name, if it's as old as the Romans, it's from the soldiers, if not, then they're just living near the milestone, some, some ancestor. <laughs> um, but it does bestow upon me the curse of two first names, because Miles is a fairly common as a, as a first name as well, so I'm constantly getting emails we have to do, dear, dear Miles. Uh, mainly I think that's because Outlook lists the, uh, the surname first, people read that and assume that's, that's my name. Uh, it was also my nickname at school because it was a pop school and it was started out so all the teachers call you by your surname and then as everyone kind of got to know each other and the first name got confused, I was kind of stuck because I thought it was the first name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, thanks thank for that, so interesting. Uh, no, no. Is everybody happy with the names then? Yeah. You've changed yours, Les, do you want to yeah, give us a little bit of not changed, but when, when I was growing up, Leslie means leader of the forts in Scottish, mm -hmm. you know, uh, British origins. But I used to get called Lanky Leslie, it's because I was this height when I was about 10, so. Oh. But, I have a book that I'm waiting to be published, you know, a children's book, and so it's going to be, my name's going to be L-J-V-V-I-E, as in wife, French, you know, mm -hmm. so L-J-V, so if you see a book when it's published, L-J-V, it's me. Oh, that's neat, why that? So I've not changed my name, but I've just... Yeah. Well, I'm going to be that's interesting. Natasha, you want to say something? Oh, Audrey, will you say something there? No? I'm sorry. 
Well, thank you so much for coming today. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, I hope you found it interesting and helpful. Um, I know some of you might want to, you know, have a, some feedback on your journaling as well. Has anyone got any, any insights about journaling that we kind of have not mentioned I'd like to add to? I've also included on the back of your sheets some reflections that maybe you want to have a look and have a think about about what you could take from the session. If there's anything interesting that you could take from it. And if you if those people who are not journaling yet, maybe there's three little steps or goals you could take, those steps towards starting, but not just starting a journal, but maintaining one as well. So thanks again. Would anyone like to comment at all on or add their insights about journaling that maybe we haven't touched on? I mean, how did, how did you keep it up? How did you maintain the journal? Because I know, Audrey, how do you do it? Um, I'm not consistent with it as much as I'd like to be, but I made it part of my morning routine. So when I get up and I have a cup of tea, that's when I do most of my right. journaling. So you're a morning person yeah. for that, yeah. you know, looking back over the day. How interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it's just something to say. Yeah. Um, well, in the, you know, the lockdown, it's coming to me, but I have this idea that I've got, you know, I've walk some in the short park. Yeah. And I, I still, we've got 50 cases, so cases, I mean, people, or I ask people about where we were at with the lockdown and everything. I've got some amazing little stories. But would that be classed as journaling? Because I wrote it down, but that wasn't about me, it was about somebody else. Your engagement with those so people, what their, yeah. Their stories, yeah, yeah, sure it is. It's anything you you do in that day and encounter something of interest to you, uh, yeah. And you're preserving those stories, you know. Yeah. So it's amazing that you you've got those, yeah. yeah. Uh, anybody else? I, I do um, like a <laughs> like a goals in my in the back of my journal. I have I write the months. Um, and things that I might like to achieve. So it can be anything as simple as um, like um, buying something that I want that I've put off or that I'll never get around to. Or, um, but I have goals. Some of them might be writing, or, but, but I do like five or six things for every month. And then I come back, when I'm writing in the journal, I'll come back and have a look at them and just remind myself. So it's just, it's a bit of self-care, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, making sure that I stick with the things that feel important. Do you know? Mm -hmm. That's very really interesting. Also, what I also found, you know, like you mentioned that, is that people often think it's looking backwards, but it's also looking forwards too, isn't it? And projecting and, and planning, you know, futures. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely frame that that you've got things to look forward to and to do and that sense of achievement when you, yes, you do achieve. Yes, I do ticket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always do them. I do, I do like ticking. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>